Thank you, and I'm the only thing that's holding us between, I'm holding you from coffee, and I know that coffee is desperately needed at this time of day, so I'll try to make this uh, quick and to the point. Uh, a little bit of a different story, uh, because it's kind of a personal story. I don't think we've heard many of those today. I mean, besides, of course, anecdotal patient experiences, which are relevant. But um, I became aware of the relevance of patient empowerment for uh, medication errors and, uh, in general, medical errors uh, through personal experiences of my own when I basically uh, saved my daughter's life at least four or five times under the best medical care in the world. So, uh, and uh, basically this is my daughter, uh, Bar, uh, when she was 15 years old. Uh, and this, uh, this was like uh, two or three weeks before her 15th birthday. Uh, and the day on, of her 15th birthday, she came to us and she said that she cannot put on the dress that she had uh, planned to put on because her ankles are swollen. So we said, uh, are you feeling well? Are you... You know, and she said, yeah, I'm feeling well. So we changed the outfit, uh, and she uh, went to the party, and we consulted some doctors, uh, but they told us to take her to the ER. So uh, after her party, we took her to the ER, where she stayed for the next several months uh, in ICU, uh, because uh, the day after, we were told that she has a, a basically, a, we were taken to a room, and we're told that she has a... Congest a severe dilated cardiomyopathy with left ventricular non-compaction. Uh, uh, and that basically, and her heart was basically, they didn't tell this to us, we figured out later, she had a 7% ejection fraction. Yeah, so she basically was, uh, this was a, a peripheral edema that she was uh, exhibiting uh, that was not from a kidney, kidney failure, but rather than a heart failure. Uh, and her heart was basically malformed since her 16th week of pregnancy. Uh, and nobody knew that until that day, uh, basically. So out of the blue, uh, uh, and uh, they didn't, uh, by the way, they told us to stay away from the internet, okay, uh, literally. Uh, and by the way, I've been told that by at least five different uh, highly uh, qualified wise doctors since, at least. And this still happens often. In any case, of course, uh, I ignored their advice like every good parent would. And essentially, everybody that gets that advice, which is so silly for wise people like doctors to give, uh, they immediately run uh, online. Uh, and they did just what I did. But what they discover is that when you go to Dr. Google, it sends you swiftly to the wild, wild web of health information, where you basically get overwhelmed by repetitive, irrelevant, outdated, unreliable, unsafe, inconsistent, and incomprehensible health information. Patients don't know what applies to them and what they can trust. They actually hope their doctors know better, but we all know their doctors actually can't keep abreast of latest developments either. Just last year alone, there were 20,000 research published on breast cancer. And last I checked, there were 1,688 open interventional recruiting clinical trials for breast cancer patients. Those are 1,600 options the doctor doesn't have the time, tools, or motivation to help find their patients. So people feel alone, but they're actually not alone in that situation. Other people have walked those paths before, okay? They, uh, they try to figure out how to reach them, and there are many of them, okay? It's very difficult to reach them. And uh, you can actually get help from others. You can help get understanding of how to process information that is otherwise complex when you're su sufficiently motivated. Okay, so um, there uh, basically comes Medivisor uh, to help patients in this situation. We radically empower patients. And when I say radically empower them, I mean it because we basically get them abreast of the latest developments faster than their doctors can. We, all, we allow the doctors to join in on that fun, and we could empower doctors as well. But we basically believe knowledge is power, and we want to get it to the patients, who, to them it matters most, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. So this is how it looks. People go online. They could sign up for Medivisor. It's a free service. Uh, they tell us a lot of uh, information about themselves, 10 questions about themselves, and five to, 15 question, five to 20 questions about every medical circumstance that they're coping with. And then we create for them immediately a personalized report. 
what are your treatment options uh, for a person in your situation, not somebody abstract. And to best of my knowledge, nothing like this exists even today, besides Medivisor. And we follow that up with all it is clinical trials, research papers, treatment options, guidelines, community resources, lifestyle tips. And we don't just give them a, re a link to the publication, we transform it and summarize it into lay language interpreted summary so mere mortals can understand it. So that's what I mean by radically empowering them. And when there's something to act upon, like for example, connecting to a healthcare system or connecting to a clinical trial, we let them take the next steps in that process and we help them broker connections between them and clinical trials, for example. And for the doctors, we could give a dashboard of all their patients. So they don't actually have to spend time going to uh, up to date or PubMed uh, or clinicaltrials.gov trying to figure it, out, figure it out because they don't have the time, tools, or motivation again. So why not have it on a contextual level per doctor, per patient, sorry. So we use a 3D health profile that includes both the, uh, the medical situation, the demographic situation, and the engagement metrics of them and everybody else and a patented technology, AI and ML, to process enormous amount of new information all the time, and scalable medical ac expertise process. Uh, so we uh, basically tr use all of these to bring to bear the solution to patients. We now have over 150,000 members to which uh, over 94% recommend us. Uh, we're number one search result on Google on over 100 keywords, first page result on 1,000. We have over 120,000 fans and followers on Facebook and Twitter, and we are a top 10 disease influencer in most of the 23 conditions we currently cover. We're being distributed by healthcare providers, uh, primarily in the US, by New York Press, Mount Sinai, uh, nonprofits like the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, customers of ours, and uh, we also could grow uh, on demand when the pharma customers of ours uh, work with us uh, and help us uh, grow to reach additional customers and users. People love what we're doing, uh, and we won a number of awards for this. And now I'll tell you a bit back, get back to my personal story of where we were able to be as empowered uh, caregivers, parents in this case, uh, and help save our daughter. So I'll give you just some of the examples. So this is a bar after leaving surgery. Two months later, basically, we, uh, we were in Israel and we moved to New York, uh, kind of a... Uh, we had to basically, first of all, I need to figure out which healthcare provider to go to. And I was able to convince everybody and the insurance and everything to make sure that we get to the right uh, healthcare provider. In Israel, by the way, just so you know, there's only 11 on average heart transplants per year and only one pediatric. That's the, it is, I was able to figure out uh, that, uh, exactly where to go and we went to move to New York Prez, uh, the Terran Hospital in, the, in New York which does 200 heart transplants a year, 25 of them pediatric. That's, uh, so one, uh, and that's only one of three healthcare systems in New York that does more transplants than Israel. Uh, of course, uh, we just don't have donors and we don't have a network of, uh, around the country or the, around our region that helps us either. So really anybody that needs a heart or an organ in Israel needs to basically uh, leave. Um, anyway, the two nurses that were trying to deal with her were obviously overemployed uh, and uh, couldn't deal with all the things that were going on, so they had to open her up in the uh, after, in her recovery room again, uh, because uh, and we were alerting about that nurse for two hours until that happened. Um, but then uh, this is, as you can see, a little bit of mess of devices, and of course you could see all the errors here, right? I'll zoom in so it'll be easier. Okay, so you're looking at that, and basically you see a glaring problem. You see that epin, uh, epinephrine, 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 right? Which is adrenaline, basically. Now, uh, how do I care about adrenaline? I don't care about adrenaline, but I have a screaming daughter with 180 uh, systolic blood pressure, uh, screaming about headaches uh, two days after the surgery. Uh, and, um, and I'm thinking about, uh, you know, they were supposed to reduce that dosage. And this is what it was supposed to be. Okay? It was 0 0.01. Okay? And they were supposed to half the dosage at that stage. But instead, uh, this is what it was. 
for two hours. So she was getting 10 times the adrenaline she needed uh, at that uh, situation. Uh, now, that's, uh, again, this is, you know, now it wasn't that bad if you actually go to the original situation, which was post-surgery, and it was 0 0.7 at the time. Okay, that looks like, you know, reasonable UX, user experience, re user, re user interface. Okay, if it's a 0 0.7, and by the way, I just happened to find these pictures today. So it's good I do last minute, minute presentations. <laughs> so, but basically, I didn't even know that I had these images. I just remembered that I, ca that I uh, spotted this problem uh, and was able to tell the doctors that they basically misdone their, do their dosage of something here. I didn't at the time look at what the adrenaline was there. But basically, this is uh, one stupid UX issue and without the, uh, myself, and whenever I went to sleep, my wife was monitoring all these devices. I told her what to look for in every change, in, uh, in every situation. And we needed to boss around the best, uh, and this was in every hospital we were, we had to, uh, to basically uh, get the staff in line with understanding that uh, we have a role in helping protect the life of my daughter. By the, uh, I was at Stanford MedX a few years ago, and another parent basically said she brought her daughter to Stanford. That hospital where it was just happening. And the nurse allowed her, her to sleep. And because she went to sleep, her daughter died. Because until then, she was a hawk. But she didn't sleep for a few days. And she brought her to the best care. And because she wasn't monitoring the situation, they turned off the alarms in the room. OK? Now. These alarms are completely misaligned, of course. Alarm fatigue is affecting the staff. It's crazy. You can't figure out anything. Everything needs to be learned from airline industries, right? So uh, the design, it's not just you know, the medications and cross-references. But we've actually done this with Medivisor. So this Anne-Marie uh, Cicciarella, that's uh, uh, here on our page, Basically, because of Medivisor, she has two profiles, one for herself as an ex-breast cancer, uh, as a breast cancer survivor, and one for her mother. And uh, without Medivisor, uh, she, her mother would have been prescribed dangerous medications for her. So she's empowered because she gets information from Medivisor. And by the way, her story, you could listen to it online, it's uh, interpreted. So this is Barr about three weeks after the surgery. She decided to get out in record time. Like, uh, I think it was 10 days that she was out of, uh, out, of the, uh, out of the hospital. And we had another six months to play around in New York. And uh, she dreamt up this shirt. If you could read it, it says, I got my heart in New York, literally. And these are her pills which, by the way, don't comply with any of the adherence standards you've just seen. I mean, standard blister packs, perhaps, but um, this is actually my QA system. So every time there's a change, I take a photograph of this. Every time I change anything in her meds, and her meds change all the time. So I have a lot of versions of this. Uh, but it lets me know what she needs all the time. Um, uh, my friend Daniel Kraft, uh, uh, who runs in, I mean, he's a excellent speaker and you should see his talks, his TED talk. He actually created this company called uh, Intellimedicine that creates a, in a home printable machine, uh, basically a polypharmacy. So you could basically get the, uh, all the ingredients of the meds you need. And not only that, uh, in future he envisions that that will be adjusted on a daily basis. So for example, if you take any measures, glucose or uh, bi you know, uh, body mo monitors or whatever you take, it could actually adjust the dosage from dose to dose because you're basically a printing a pill. And it fills it and creates it for you on the spot. Okay, so you could uh, do a lot to empower patients. So you take three things. Patients and caregivers can help 
give them a role, they're the most underutilized resource in the system. They're another set of eyes that are much more motivated than the uh, sleep-deprived staff that may be excellent. And again, uh, in every healthcare system, 95% of their staff are the top notch that I've met, but there's always 5% that are just not on their egg day. They may be great. We were told that two of the nurses that really fucked up, okay, uh, were the best nurses, and yet they made serious mistakes with us. So give us a role. Uh, you have to give us the tools, so trust us with those tools. And I know that somebody said, uh, I think we, lament, we spoke earlier, whether we can trust the patients uh, or the caregivers, and, and not everybody you can. Okay, so some uh, can be empowered and not everybody. Uh, but you could always shift them in health literacy, in education and engagement, all the way to empowerment. Uh, listen to them because uh, that's, uh, you know, you have to not ignore these things. It's really stupid. Uh, they know more than you about a lot of the things. And there are tools now and soon coming uh, that you want to embrace faster than the 17 years it usually takes for scientific discovery to become part of clinical care. Um, thank you.